Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Joining us right now, and he's always able to rip up the script, is William Lee. Definitive at the IMF. He's a chief economist for Mr. Milken out at the Milken Institute. There's soiree coming up, you know. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's great. Oh, okay. Yeah. They give me a corner room at the Beverly Hills Hotel off Perfect. the pool. Perfect. Yep. A little cabana. The suite. Thing. I'm yep. not going this year, but, okay. you know, there it is. Bill Lee, chief economist at Milken. And only with Bill Lee can I rip up the script. Is three hours ago, a video came out of Ambassador Nicholas Burns of Swellesley, Massachusetts. And one, the Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen. Yep. And Bill Lee there at the Jinga Brewing Company, opened in 2012 by Alex Acker and Christian Lee. It's a microbrewery in Beijing. And we're down to our export-import policy in trade with China, Bill Lee, of discussing American hops in a beer in Beijing. How desperate are we in our policy now with China Or is it cogent and cohesive? Well, the real question is how desperate are the Chinese with their import-export policies? They know they can't live without the United States, uh, but they want to have the United States come to them on their terms. Uh, You know, for every story that we hear about how the Chinese economy is reviving, there are stories that we also hear that don't match up with the official data. Uh, iconic places on on Nanjing Road in in Shanghai uh, that have long been establishments that serve the elites of business are starting to shut down because there's no business. And they really need to have our import-export policies in place because they need stuff from the United States just as much as the United States needs stuff from them. You are expert at this, Bill Lee, and I know Hong Kong gets all the attention and the emotion of the British and that, but you just zeroed in on Shanghai. Are we looking for a jump condition change from Beijing to say, okay, we didn't mean it, let's get back to business, or is this some slow motion incremental soap opera? In fact, the jump condition I'm actually seeing is that for, you know, a lot of people say, you know, the secondary cities are, are, are not doing so well, but that's okay because the primary cities of Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, uh, those are the p- places where businesses are really booming and they're doing fine. And that's what the official storyline has been. And every official meeting you see uh, that, that the, the Chinese authorities have held have peddled that story. But the story on the ground, when you look at the shopping malls in these elite places, they're not doing well. Mm. I have some friends who are trying to sell property in some of the prime places in Beijing, and they're starting off with bids that are 30, 40% off their, their, their asking price. And even there, they're not getting much, uh, much activity. So the, the situation on the ground with the people who live there and the people who are doing businesses there uh, is really quite different from the official picture. And Bill, I think what a lot of our listeners and viewers like myself are probably confused about, we see a very hard line coming from China, it seems like by and large as it relates to their view of Capitalism. I just think about you know kind of how they dealt with the technology industry a few years ago in Alibaba and all those companies. Yet at the same time, we see leading U.S. executives Tim Cook, uh, uh, the fellow from Tesla, going over to China and trying to maintain and develop ties there. Where does the government really want to take this thing? President Xi has a campaign to what he he's trying to put in what he calls new productive forces into the Chinese economy that will push them into the bleeding edge, the leading edge of technology. The most important industries will be the high tech industries, the high value added industries, so that the the declining population in China will be having uh, occupations and jobs that are in high salary uh, 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 occupations. What we are seeing in reality is that they really can't get this stuff in place without first reviving the Chinese economy. You can't get that kind of technological change and productivity change with an economy that is in the doldrums and where GDP growth, 
you know, as much as the official numbers are, you know, five plus, uh, the actual numbers are closer to three plus. So should we expect or should, I guess, you know, American and Western CEOs expect any meaningful change in the next several years here? Because, again, it seems like the U.S. and the West is are, we're in a pretty strong position vis-a-vis China just in terms of negotiating leverage. That's a very important point, Paul. Um, the current businesses that are there in China are realizing that President Xi's new China is going to involve a lot more in the way of state enterprises being in the in the driver's seat. Uh, the smaller private sector companies are asked to merge with their counterparts on the official side. So everyone that's doing business there knows they have to curry the favor of local authorities because that's where their new contracts are coming from. Uh, and, and I think you're seeing Tim Cook go over there, opening up a new branch, uh, a new Apple store, probably one of the biggest in, in Asia, in Shanghai. But at the same time, that same shopping mall is seeing stores close left and right and on, on, you know, in private, as private businesses are starving for business. So, so I think the, the new mantra for businesses going into China would be, you know, help the state-owned enterprises become more efficient, uh, do whatever managerial magic you can to, help, to right. have them come up in productivity. But is, tr- is, is sanctity of contracts still valid versus joint venture tragedies of recent decades? As, as, as you know, Tom, the sanctity of contracts in China depends upon who you know in the, ju- in the judicial system. And, right. and whether or not you are currying the favor and, and your policies are in line with those of the, of the Communist Party vision of where China is going. If you're helping <clears throat> Chinese companies promote their activities, your contracts will be in force, full, full force. If you are hitting off on your own right. and trying to carve out a share of the Chinese market for yourself without involving the Chinese right. uh, state-owned enterprises, your contracts are likely not going to be held. If they're finally to a more manufacturing value add, higher wage industrial proposition. Where is the old China now? Is it in Vietnam? Is there a certain geography that is doing the old China? You know, President Xi wants a lot of the low value added industries to move out of China because he wants to highlight uh, those those high tech, high value added uh, sectors in China and develop them further. But one of the things that we all know is that as in China right now is at that inflection point where they have to promote the service sector. And in order to promote the service sector, that means you have to have strong domestic demand. You're not going to get that when people's wages are uncertain, their property values have dropped, and 70% of their household wealth is, is, in, is in danger of, of crashing and burning. Uh, so, so I think the, the policies that have to be put in place by the Chinese government would be to put in a safety net to assure people that their retirement is secure so that they can actually start to spread, spend more freely with the security of knowing that they have income in their old age. That's one of the first principles I think that would be helpful for the, the, the Chinese economy and to, to revive economy in the direction that President Xi wants it to go. Bill, if someone comes up to you at your renowned conference and says, Bill, I think China is uninvestable, what's your response? I think that that's a naive view. Um, I, I, I've often heard that said. You you can invest in China and invest in China very successfully if you follow the new principles of investing in China, which is you know promote the state, promote the state goals of of, of improving the Chinese economy. If if you have that in mind and find projects like that, you're really in good shape. Now, one of the problems of of actually implementing that in real life is due diligence. Uh, the Chinese have made it incredibly difficult for investors to find out what are the viable investment projects that they can invest in without uh, being told to put money in particular places. Uh, and that's the tension is yeah. the, the, the private investor just can't find their own means to verify things without uh, relying on state information. Bill, you have 10 more questions. We're not mm-hmm. gonna get to them, we're out of time. William Lee, thank you so much. Always brilliant on the Pacific Rim. And now, the popular acclaim. She was on with us uh, a number of weeks ago in a huge response to Victoria Bills, Chief Investment Strategist at Bannery and Capital Chicago. And in your note, I, the note's great, Victoria, but there's only one thing to talk about. Shortage of bit dog, <laughs> ETF madness, 
And am I right, Victoria, you're framing out up $40,000 on BitDog to 100,000 plus, is that true? Absolutely. If we're thinking about the factors that are coming into play, and thanks again for having me on, we're ha we're seeing a lot of kind of continued traction that's coming into the market because of the upcoming halving that's happening in April. And we already saw an uptick in Bitcoin pricing because of the introduction of the spot ETF earlier this year, which drove the price close to almost like se over 70,000. So we can honestly expect with the decrease of supply that's now coming into the market for Bitcoin on top of that very out outpaced demand that we can actually expect over 100K in pricing by end of year. Wow, end of year. And Tom, we're kind of on our way there today. We're up 4%. Bitcoin is 72,100. So uh, back up to those uh, rarefied Can we have levels. a moment of silence for Michael McGlone? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's down there on the, <laughs> on the deck at the at the, at the, uh, uh, the Bethany, whatever it is, the hotel. The he back, might be at the Delano. You know, he might rate the Delano. I don't yeah, know. you know, well, you know, he's like huge. Yep. So, I mean, he's been calling it. So, uh, Victoria, aside from uh, Bitcoin, because I still can't get Jamie Dimon to, you know, give it the stamp of approval, although he is all into to AI. So on the AI front, which is a subject of Jamie Dimon's or part of, partly subject in Jamie Dimon's letter today, NVIDIA, is that still the way for investors to play AI or are there other ways? How do you guys think about that? I think that NVIDIA is definitely the way to pay pay through AI. If we're thinking about what has to go into these AI language learning models. There's also need, there's high computing and, G, and um, graphic processing that's necessary in order to create these large processing models. But also to pivot back to Bitcoin, it's also a necessity when it comes to um, Bitcoin mining. So we're going to see a huge uptick in the demand for NVIDIA GPU chips as well, which are top of the line when it comes to mining, but also top of the line when it comes to graphic processing and also informational processing, which is absolutely yeah. critical when it comes to AI. So mm -hmm. NVIDIA is the number one player, and I'm so sorry for everyone who keeps trying to short it. I can't <laughs> find a reason well, for it to go down. Okay, I wanted Paul to ask another, <laughs> intelligent, Paul to ask another <laughs> intelligent question here because I can't do it. But you go to the heart of the matter. Victoria Bills is saying, forget about the value trap. Forget about straw hats and winter. Climb on board the winners. Discuss that strategy. It's as simple as what we're seeing in the future, the future of Web3 going into Web4, the necessity around AI in terms of increased productivity and how that plays into, again, all of the large processes that are coming into the market these days or more of the innovative technologies. A, what is required to process AI, what is required to actually create these systems is large computing process is large sets of computing process and data. So when we think about the players that are ahead of the game and the players that are actually benefiting from getting into this space very early on, that's how Nvidia was able to make themselves a player. And then even with um, super process like um, super like um, S um, super small computer, super smart computer. Sorry, I was blinking on the name. Super smart. I like computer super as well. small computers. That's cute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's good. <laughs> super small computer as well. <laughs> They have been a leaders when it, leader in the game when it comes to just that data right. information processing. Now, some of the drawbacks to that, of course, is what's going to happen when it comes to climate change. These, like, it's a lot of energy that it right. takes to, again, process all of this I as mean, well. Pa Paul, I'm looking at NVIDIA, 73 PE multiple. One year forward, it's a 36 PE multiple. Yep. It's as simple as this, folks. I've never seen that. I've never seen, I've never that. seen and, that. And that's, Tom, you know, a company earning its way into its multiple, I guess, is kind of what we're seeing there. So, uh, Victory, in addition to the technology names, I know you guys also have a uh, healthcare bent, Novartis. Why is that on your list? Well, Novartis has an amazing track record when it comes to what the work that they're doing in clinical trials. Um, I'm also very b bullish on kind of a lot of the information that we're seeing nowadays with people being very conscientious around their health. Um, whether that's weight loss or weight gain planning, um, trying to make certain like people are looking forward to trying to stay as young as possible. And so a lot of the healthcare names that we're looking at are companies that are in those sorts in those sorts of fields. So Novartis being one of them as well. Uh, t tell me about this burgeoning sector. Michael Barr, listen to this. This is important. Victoria Bills, please tell me about the new sector keeping us as young as possible. 
How many stocks are? In oh yeah, please. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's a there's a couple of names that are going into it, but a lot. It's mostly a lot of research that's going into yeah. trying to figure out gener generatively how we can continue to keep people looking younger, healthier. Whether whether that's again right. through diet and exercising, through like Thank consumer you. based product companies, or again like if we're looking on the healthcare side, so companies mm -hmm. that are looking to basically like for lack of a better word, yeah. figure out how to recreate a human. So a oh, lot well, of the, thank you. like... <laughs> Victoria, thank you for uh, working on recreating a human. Victoria Bills in Chicago, cut and chisel. Thank you. Uh, this is a joy because he's beyond qualified. Right now, everyone is pontificating about private equity, private credit. Someone with some actual experience in the risks involved, Hugh Von Stienis, uh, joins us. He's at Oliver Wyman right now, but with a deserved resume across the United <laughs> Kingdom of excellence, including assisting Oxford University in the management Pardon, of their uh, money. Hugh Von Stienis, I'm gonna cut to the chase with your lovely photo of Mark Rowan of Apollo on your note, private credit will trigger a new squeeze. That's powerful language of you, Van Stienis. What do you mean? Uh, well, thanks for having you on again, Tom. Look, I think there's a couple of squeezes. I mean, the first and the most obvious one is uh, for the traditional long-only firms. More and more money is going to private credit. Uh, there's expectation it might double over the next four or five years. And therefore, and more, and private credit is either the number one or number two most popular asset to allocate to from high net worth or from institutional investors. So I think it's putting a lot of squeeze on traditional fund management companies. I think second, those, as when I look at it, I think there's also a squeeze on the banks. And I think one of the most interesting things to me, uh, Tom and Paul, is how the banks have come out of the gates really hard this year, particularly the, the really big banks are reopening their wallets to lend into leveraged buyouts. And so you remember last year, um, you know, the president of Blackstone, John Gray, said that it was a golden moment. What's really interesting to me, I mean, 86% of all LBOs were financed by private credit last year, up from in the 50s and 60s, four years earlier. This year, though, 27 companies have gone to banks rather than private credit, issuing about $11.5 billion. And that's taking back about half the, what private credit uh, got, got in 2023. So there's a really big squeeze going on between the banks and private credit players, too. Yeah, that's kind of where I wanted to go, Hugh. I started out my career at the Chase Manhattan Bank and the media group, and we lent money to companies that forget about having revenue. All they had were airwaves, think cellular telephone companies back in the day, and we'd lend them senior credit. We would never let this lucrative business go to any competitor, including this private credit thing. So what, what have the banks, why have the banks been so, I don't know, I'm not willing to let this business go, but to allow private credit to really flourish? Well, look, I think as ever with banks, it's a, it's a mixture of things. Number one, though, is regulation. The regulators didn't want the largest banks to take the uh, riskiest uh, pieces of, of, of debt. And whether it's in Europe or in the US, there's been a real focus on uh, the quantity of leverage finance being done by the big banks. And that's why you've seen the shift. It was probably in the sort of 50 to 60 percent before the pandemic, up to as much as 86 percent uh, last year. But what we're seeing is for investment grade companies, the largest banks are now back in business. For the non-investment grade, that's still very much going towards private credit. But it's the so it's the regulators. But last year as well, it's about risk aversion. You know, on the back of SVB and Credit Suisse failing, the banks just drew in their their risk appetites and are coming into this year. They realise if they're not there right. printing business this year, they're not going to be there in years to come either because the private credit players will squeeze them out. Here, over to banking. Can you say all clear for European banks? Shock of shock, they're doing better for the first time in ages. Can you, Van Stina, say it's a better place in 2026 for European big banks? Uh, look, I think it's a much better environment. Look, the, 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 the really big problem for Europe is, was uh, moving into negative interest rates. This is an Alice in Wonderland move that you've spoken about many times before, which crushed the earnings of the banks. And as they come out to sort of more normalized levels of interest rates, the banks are making okay-ish returns again. Now, it's still below where we'd like it to be, uh, but I can see a scenario where European banks get to a 11 to 12, maybe, you know, to, to a return on equity environment, but they're still trading at 0 0.6, 0 0.65 times tangible book, almost half where some of the US firms are. So I think there's a, the interest rate environment's there. 
look, there are these there are some nerves um, because the European regulators did stop the banks paying dividends back in the pandemic. But I think these were exceptional circumstances. And we're now seeing a situation where banks are buying back shares. Share counts are coming down two to three percent a year, much you know, getting towards U.S. levels. So I think this is a really interesting environment. And as we spoke about last time, there was something like close to a 12 percent dividend plus buyback yield on the European banking index. So we're in a, we've, there's quite a bit of um, a risk shield in terms of that, 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 those, that cash payout. Hugh, can you explain to our listeners and viewers what Basel end game is and what it means for the banks? I, I wish I, I wish I could, Paul. Look, so um, there are so there are uh, Basel are the internationally agreed rules, and so the U.S. was meant to implement the the last stage of it, which was the Basel end game. However, it got conflated with a whole bunch of other stuff. I mean, we, you know, there are lessons to be learned from um, the failure of SVB and the other regional banks. One of which was the deregulation and desupervision of many of these regional banks, and so. That's nothing to do with Basel or Endgame at all, but got lumped into it. You could probably also say that we're in an environment where um, there's a good piece of work recently showing that um, right. uninsured depositors, deposits are roughly double today than they were 20 right. years ago as a percentage of the system. So how do you then think about the risks of liquidity, of these large ticket uninsured depositors running at digital speeds? So of course, rules need to be refined right. for that. But I think the Basel end game ended up mixing too many pieces, and that's why it's gone back to the drawing board. Yvonne Cena is with us with Oliver Wyman, of course, a service to the United Kingdom with the Bank of England. Yvonne Cena, uh, the diamond letter is out. You'll read every word. I'll read every word. And it goes to the heart of the matter in a new debate on global, uh, on New York Wall Street, I should say, which is should the chairman and CEO tasks be two individuals? Where do you stand? Gosh, uh, well, look, so maybe having, even though I've spent a lot of time on Wall Street, obviously I'm based uh, in Europe and where on the whole, the chair and the CEO regime is split. Uh, that's been working quite well from a good number of companies. And even my old firm, Morgan Stanley, at the moment are splitting that for, for a period of time. I think it could be helpful. Uh, what I can see is where the chair is providing wise counsel to the CEO and helping them think through the complexities of life. It can be very helpful, right. uh, but I, you know, look. Uh, every market has its differences. I think it's useful, but not mission critical. You know, Hugh, we, we, I got time for one more question. It's very important. We were having a huge response on YouTube, our live chat, Hugh Von Steenis, worldwide. That Von Steenis is so cool. He knows <laughs> the status small grand piano oh. is totally <laughs> second rate to the classy upright. I mean, are you rocking the Beckstein, the Bosendorfer, the Schimmel? Which upright are you guys rocking, Hugh? Uh, do you know what? I'm afraid this one's actually a Yamaha. And the reason is, yeah. um, if you want to play really quick trills, you need a modern piano, because the old ones don't do really fast right. music. So for me, but for other family members who play better than I do, that's why we got it. The Yamaha, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just got a different keyboard. I mean, the Beckstein's old school. Yeah, okay. and you can't yeah do I mean, it. look, my, my aunt was a, was a concert pianist, but I'm, I'm afraid that uh, she's a little bit better than me. Okay, you've been seeing this with our piano report for the morning. <laughs> Thank you so much with Oliver uh, Wyman as well. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Today's headlines, weekend headlines too. She was cheating. Bloomberg <laughs> Surveillance and our news headlines with Lisa Mateo. It's brought to you by Interactive Brokers Bond Marketplace Access. Their vast selection of over 1 million global fixed income securities. No markups or built-in spreads with low transparent commissions. Learn more at ibkr.com slash bonds, ibkr.com slash bonds. Lisa, what do you have? All right, we're starting with the eclipse. Now, remember Paul had mentioned Buffalo is like one of those key places where you can see it clearly. Well, Bloomberg actually spoke with the Buffalo uh, Niagara, the Visit Buffalo Niagara, and they said that they're calling it the Super Bowl or the Taylor Swift concert wow. of events. Like it's going to be that big, as many as a million visitors expected to go to Buffalo. The bars, they're selling tickets to solar eclipse viewing parties. You have breweries having parties, releasing 
eclipse themed drafts. Everyone's jumping on board here. And speaking of jumping, skydive the falls. They're offering adrenaline junkies a totality jump. Nice. So if you're up for it, <laughs> you can, I guess, grab your glasses and jump off, I don't know where, and, and enjoy that. Uh, wine country, but the other thing is traffic. So you okay. have the Adirondacks, North Country. Troopers are telling commuters expect traffic jams of as long as 12 mm. hours. What? So it's going to be aye, aye, a little aye. bit crazy over Study there. the clouds. Yeah. It's, it, it, for, it, there's two groups of people, those that have done a total solar eclipse and those that have it. And it is completely ancient cosmic. My, my major eclipse was in Hawaii oh, in 1991. Oh, and uh, it, it is as built. All I can say, forget about all the touchy-feely stuff for the astronomy <laughs> that I lived. It is as billed. It is spectacular. But again, this is up by Buffalo and Rochester. Wait, You're not going to see the same wallop uh, in Central Park or, you know. Jersey right. Shore. What else do you have? Jersey Shore. <laughs> Check it out. Yes. We'll go to the beach. i got to update my glasses now. I think I'm, I'm, I'm too late, though. <laughs> um, all right, so the Wall Street Journal. Banks and credit card unions, they are turning to NIL, you know, name, in, yep. image, likeness, <clears throat> college athletes, to attract more Gen Zers. So they want to attract the younger audience because they say the younger audience actually stick around because changing accounts is, is too difficult. They don't want to do it. So once they lock in, they stay. That means they can also get them sooner for credit cards and loans and things like uh, that. Yeah. But the athletes are saying that it's helping them kind of budget their money, learning how to save. Um, you have Park Bank in Madison, Wisconsin. They actually doubled their Instagram engagement after posting a new campaign with several local athletes. So the University of Wisconsin. Starting, okay. Yeah, so it's starting to pick up. Right. Athletes making like six figures. I mean, you have Caitlin Clark exactly. <laughs> who's bringing in some good money from things like this. And her WNBA rookie contract will be like 75 grand a year. Know, she she does that in 15 minutes now with her endorsements. <laughs> okay. Why, why is that? I mean, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I get it. Okay, TV, it's not the same it. as some NBA mm -hmm. player is going to have somebody in the Celtics. Yeah. But Seventy-five grand. Exactly, it's unbelievable the rookie contract, <laughs> and it's simply because they they don't have the the TV money yet. That's going to change next time well, around. It'll change. It'll change. I can just see you know Apple or Amazon coming in to straighten that out. Yep. Next, Lisa, what do you got? <laughs> uh, okay, so Americans. Were you at Michael her. Barr's party? No, I missed it. I couldn't go. I, I, I had another thing. There was, and my, there was I was so talking many with her wife I, back and forth. Yeah. I know. I didn't even know Scarlett was there. Until you like just, through. It's that oh, many. Who's here? <laughs> I've always Star wanted to go studded. to Sylvia's, though. That's the yeah. other reason you, you, why. Scarlet, she loaded up on the catfish. Oh, oh catfish. <laughs> what do you got? Oh, now I'm hungry. All right, thanks a lot. Um, ha Americans, you know during the pandemic, everyone bought puppies, right? Well, apparently the Better Business Bureau is saying that Americans lost over $1 million last year falling for online puppy adoption oh, scams. Boy. So a lot of people fell for it. There was a North Carolina grandmother said she lost her life savings on a <clears throat> Facebook pet scam. She wanted to buy yeah. this Yorkshire Terrier for her grandson. But the FTC says stick with the local shelters. Yeah. Look out for those. They're, when they're asking for unusual payment requests, look out for that. Um, Better Business Bureau is saying that about 80% of sponsored pet advertisements online are possibly fake. So don't fall for it. A lot. Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. Don't go there to look for puppies. I just ignore it. Just <laughs> click X, go next one. Yeah. All right. What else you got for us? <laughs> and finally, this new um, study is showing that workers. See, this is what I want to do. Yes. Okay. Combining business with leisure travel. So, leisure. Leisure. That's on the rise right now. Yes, that's the new term for it. Um, the market was just over $315 billion in 2022. A lot of studies saying it can reach more than $731 billion by 2032. Okay, the reason why post-pandemic work yep. life changed, right? So more people are being asked to go into the office. So now they have to actually use like a lot more vacation days. So they want to book it on a little travel so deal. The, so coming up, Alex Steele and I, we're taking our Bloomberg Intelligence show on the road. We're going down to uh, Nashville, Tennessee Ooh. for a couple of, so maybe take a couple personal days, go to the Grand Old Opry, do all that kind do of stuff. Right. Since you're yeah. there. Yeah. How cool would yeah. that be? Yeah, but so, there's a problem. What, what so I'm going to talk to Colin about that. The, the, He's yeah. got the road trip to Nashville <laughs> yes. at the perfect time of year, and you and I are stuck here in 40 degrees. <laughs> What's going That's on? We, everybody wants, you know, Alex Steele, she's a star. But that, so. but that, it makes sense. I mean, yep. I, I don't know, but there well, is a you, problem. You definitely though. hear that from the hotel operators. They're saying yes. they're definitely seeing that. The problem, though, is that the company, there's a struggle for companies to figure out where their legal obligation begins and ends ah, for the employer. Point. So, you know, you book your travel with the company. So are is the company responsible for you that's throughout a good point. your 
leisure sure of part of it. Yep. So yeah. a lot of companies kind of changing their policies. Lisa oh. Mateo, thank we'll you see. so much. Greatly appreciate it. Huge, huge response to our newspaper section. Lisa's in here. I mean, she's in here at 6.58 doing work on yeah, this. Just, you know, yeah. Starting in on it. And yep. We do that every day. The newspaper has a segment here at 7.45. Thank you, Interactive Brokers, for helping us uh, uh, with that. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.